I'm stuck. Just a moment. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's uh, great to see faces. Uh, it's been such a long time since I've preached not to a screen. And I'm, to be honest, I'm a little bit nervous about it. Uh, I, I, I'm just used to having my manuscript right in front of me and pretending that I, I know everything by heart and then just speaking to you guys. And now I got to actually look up and, and look at faces and I'm able to see reactions. And uh, at least I can see eyes now. Uh, hopefully one day we can see full mouth expressions again and see people actually are smiling or frowning at me or, or uh, that way. But um, uh, let me just introduce myself a little bit. Uh, my name is Massimo. I'm one of the elders here at Gospel City Church. Uh, if you are with us here for the first time, uh, we're so glad that you were able to join us, um, whether physically or with us on Zoom as well. Uh, but even if you're here for us uh, the second or third time, uh, a warm welcome to you as well. Uh, we hope that as a church, we are able to get to know you better uh, over the next weeks to come as well. Now, we are in the Advent season. Uh, today is the third Advent. Uh, in the Advent season, Christians take time to reflect every week, um, and usually they light a candle. And I think the typical thing is hope, joy, rest, peace, uh, love, uh, one of those things. And in Christ, uh, if you have a fifth candle as well. Uh, but we as a church have decided to reflect on the five solas. And we have been doing that a week by week. Uh, we are going through five solas, sola Deo Gloria, sola Scriptura, sola Fide, sola Gratia, solus Christus. And we have arranged it in that way, particularly because we just changed the typical statement around from what it is to, for God's glory alone, according to Scripture alone, we are saved through faith alone, by grace alone, through the work of Christ alone. And that's the order in which we are actually doing our sermon series. So today is the um, third one, and we titled the whole series, Here We Stand. Uh, these words are actually taken from Martin Luther. Uh, 500 years ago, um, exactly 500 years ago, exactly um, uh, 1521, um, April 18th to be really precise, but 1521, so 500 years ago, Martin Luther stood before uh, the Emperor Charles V and uh, various other officials from uh, the church and the country in uh, Worms, Germany. It was called the Diet of Worms. Um, has nothing to do with eating worms. Just uh, the diet is just the way the meeting was called, and Worms is the German city. Uh, so it was just a, a meeting in the German city called Worms. But it did open up a can of worms um, as he was speaking there. And um, one article said this. Uh, he was standing there, and it was 6 o'clock in the evening, and by this time, and the room was lit with torches. Uh, the room was crowded and very hot. Luther was literally pressed in from all sides with people straining to hear every one of his words. It was wall to wall, full with people, the richest, most powerful, most influential leaders of Luther's world were there and were waiting to hear his answer to the question, do you recant or not? In front of Luther were, were, were books, devotionals, uh, writings that he has done over the last 10 years. And they were asking that he would recant or retract his positions that he has written about. And the question is, do you recant or not? And Martin Luther stood up and with a clear voice, he said this. Unless I'm convinced by the testimony of scriptures and by clear reason, for I do not trust the Pope or councils alone, since they are well known to have often erred and contradicted themselves, I'm bound by the scriptures that I have quoted. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. As a church, on the five solas, here we stand and we can do no other, so help us God. Not because of Martin Luther, um, but because of Scripture alone, which we talked about last week. Not for Martin Luther's glory, but for God's glory, which we talked about two weeks ago. We, like Martin, read the Scriptures and stand on the same convictions, that one is justified by grace through faith in Christ alone, according to the Scripture, for the glory of God alone. So, 
Having said that we are convicted by scriptures, I think it's a good time for actually go into a biblical text and read that today. Uh, today is not an expository sermon. Um, at GCC, we usually study through books in the Bible together. But for this series, it's, a, it's, it's topical sermons, but we still do want to read a text that encompasses the main point of the sermon. So please um, grab your Bibles and turn to Galatians 2, 15 to 3, 14. And I'll do the same here. So let me read Galatians 2, 15 through 3, 14, and I'm reading out of the English Standard Version, the ESV. It says this, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who left me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for, our, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law? or by hearing with faith, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. This is God's word. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your word, and Father, we ask for your grace right now. Uh, Father, that uh, your word will impact our lives, that we would be able to comprehend your word, and Father, we will be able to trust your word. But Father, most of all, that you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will give us the gift of faith. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, after reading this passage, I almost feel like saying amen, 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 and going back to my seat. Um, because really, it says everything that needs to be said. Uh, Martin Luther looked at this passage and he was convicted uh, from scripture about sola fide. So today's sermon, that's what we're going to be focusing on, faith alone. And uh, Martin Luther uh, did say that the doctrine of justification, which means being made right with God, being in the right standing with God, standing not guilty before God, justification by, is by faith alone, and that justification by faith alone doctrine is by which the church stands or falls. It's a primary, primary doctrine that we need to understand. 
Now, how did he come to that statement? And again, let me take us back 500 years again, uh, this time 511 years uh, ago. Uh, so now it's 1510. Um, and since I have some Portuguese family here of mine today, uh, that's one year before Portugal invaded Malaysia. Yeah? Um, um, so one year before Portugal invaded Malaysia, 51510, um, a German monk was plagued with his personal sin and felt terrible. This is Martin Luther. Um, and he wanted absolution. Uh, he felt condemned and he wanted to be free. So what he did, he went to this place called uh, Sancta Scala, uh, the Holy Steps, which were 26 marble steps that are claimed to be the, the steps that Jesus uh, walked on when he was judged by Pilate. Um, so you might ask, so did he go to Jerusalem? Uh, no, he went to Rome because in 326, uh, the mother of uh, Constantinople, Constantine um, actually imported those steps step by step uh, into Rome. And uh, so he was there. Um, and as he was walking up these steps, he was praying on his knee every step. And he was hoping that the church would forgive him, that his sins will be taken away from him. Now, you might think, uh, that's some old-fashioned kind of belief. Um, nowadays, people wouldn't think that you have to do absolution or penance in, in, in this way. But I came upon a Catholic travel guide, and uh, here are the words of, of that travel guide. It says this, you can go to the scala uh, uh, and to the steps, and you can attain plenary indulgence or remittance of temporal punishment due to sin by climbing the stairs. To receive a plenary indulgence, you must ascend the entire staircase. Otherwise, a partial indulgence may be gained for every step on the knees while meditating on the passion of Christ. Of course, the usual conditions for indulgence must be met, making a sacramental confession, receiving the Eucharist, praying for the intentions of the Pope, and being free of all attachment to sin. So just to say, this is not a, a, just an old school belief. This is something that people believe today as well, that you can have penance by walking up these stairs. So Martin Luther there was here. He was on his knees. He was in despair. He was hoping to pay for his sin by on his knees climbing up the stairs. And suddenly what happened? A passage of the Old Testament came to mind. Habakkuk 2.4. And it says, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And something clicked. And he stood up and immediately he descended to the stairs and he went back to his hometown in Germany. And he started going through scriptures and trying to understand what does this mean. And five years later, five years after that, October 31st, 1517, he took a thesis. It had 95 points. And he nailed it against the doors of a German church, which marked the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. So Habakkuk 2.4 triggered his thought process, but of course, combing through the scriptures, he suddenly found similar statements all over the Bible. One of them, for example, is Romans 1.17, where it says, For in the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Or Hebrews 10.38, But my righteous one shall live by faith. Or in the passage that we just read earlier on, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. And continuing to look through the whole scriptures, he saw affirming statements in both the Old and the New Testament. For example, in Ephesians 2, as we read this morning, that we are saved by grace through faith. Or Romans chapter 4. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness, talking about Abraham. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be continued, uh, counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. And of course, Romans 4, as I said, is talking about Genesis, the story of Abraham. And in chapter 15 of Genesis, it says that the righteousness of Abraham was credited to him because he believed. So even in the Old Testament beginning, the first book in the Bible, it says that righteousness is credited to somebody because of belief, because of faith. So what does it all mean to be justified by faith? 
to be saved by faith alone. Well, that's what we're going to spend the, the rest of our time this morning to explore together by talking through three questions. And these are the three questions I'll try to answer. What is faith? Why does faith have to be alone? And what happens when faith is not alone? So three questions. What is faith? Why does faith have to be alone? And what happens when faith is not alone? So the first question, what, what is faith? Now just for a moment, just, just in your chair, think about it for yourself. What, what is your definition of faith? Uh, do you have a definition? It, 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 it's a tricky one, isn't it? To, to really try to put in a, in a single statement what, what faith is. I mean, is, is, is faith blind? Is it a word used when there is no evidence? Uh, is it just another way to say religion? You know, like I'm of the Christian faith, I'm of the Buddhist faith, I'm of the Islamic faith. Is it just another way of saying religion? Or is faith the opposite of doubt? That means you either have doubt or you have faith. Or is it merely a, a, a mustering up of personal conviction? You know, I have faith in myself. I, I trust in myself. Well, if you, if you look around scripture, um, I found one scripture that said what faith is. Uh, it's Hebrews 11. It's a, it's, a, it's a famous passage that many of us know. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, I think to really understand what this means, you have to read Hebrews 9, 10, 11, and 12. Because even though that statement is there, it doesn't really help us to really understand what it means. And even the author of Hebrews then took like a couple of chapters to really explain it. He gives examples and stories, and stories usually help to explain what faith usually is. But let's go back to the statement now. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So does it mean you just close your eyes, you hope for something, and then you must have some kind of confidence in it, and then that's faith. It's the assurance of things hoped for, so you hope for something, and then the conviction of the things that you're not seeing and being really convicted about, and absolutely that's not what it means. And as I said, to really understand uh, that statement, you have to read the whole Hebrews 9, 10, 11, 12. So how do we then define it? Well, sometimes it's really helpful to understand something by going through what it is not. And I have a whole bunch of knots here, and uh, we're going to go through them. So the question is, is faith the opposite of thinking? And I say, no, it's not. Because faith requires three things. It requires a fact. There's, so there's a statement, there's a truth statement, there's a, there's a fact that is being put out. Then it requires the comprehension and affirmation of that fact. You need to understand what that fact is and what it's trying to say. And then thirdly, you need to trust that that fact is true and put your trust in it. So there's a lot of thinking involved because first you must hear a statement, then you must understand that statement, and then you must trust that statement. So faith is not the opposite of thinking. It is actually thinking deeply on, on, on certain things. For example, I mean, the typical example that is used, you take a chair and say, here's a chair, and I'm saying that you can sit on the chair and you won't fall, it won't break down. That's the statement. And then you look at the chair and you're like, oh yes, it looks stable, it has, it has feet on the ground, it, has, it looks stable, it has, it's made of good material. Uh, it, it, I, I, I comprehend that I won't fall down. And then you trust it, and the way you show that you trust it is you, you sit on the chair. And you sitting on the chair then shows that you have faith in the chair. There's a fact, there is a comprehension, and then there is a trust. Um, another one, I think the Gospel Coalition uses that one, they talk about a plane. Um, so you can go to the airport and you see a, a, a plane take off. So the, the statement is that a, a plane, when it goes fast enough, it will rise up into the air. So that's the statement, and you can observe it. You can go to the airport, you can actually see it. You might have some basic comprehension of it because you know that if speed happens and the way the wings are made, then a, a, a force happens, which is called lift, and it then lifts up the plane. Now, I'm no aeronautical engineer, and that's probably as, ba as much as I understand of why this works. But I have some basic comprehension of it. Not, I know I'm, I'm not a, an engineer, as I said. You, know, you don't have to be a theologian to understand the Christian faith, but basic comprehension of what it works. And then for me to show you or prove to anybody that I really 
belief that the plane can take off and not crash is by me actually buying a ticket and sitting in a plane. That shows that I trust that the plane will not crash and take off and be able to fly. So, was it faith that saves? What is the Christian faith? The faith is, what is the truth claim? Well, we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that we are sinful, and that he came down and he lived a sinless life and then died for our punishment. The punishment that we deserve, he paid for it. He paid the price for it on the cross. And then he died and he rose again. And that is where we place our faith, and that's the Christian faith. So you got to hear it, Faith comes from hearing, and then you have to understand it. And to understand it means that, oh, I understand now because I'm, I'm a sinful person, because God is good, and because he created the world, and he, he told me to live my life in a particular way, and I have chosen to live it my own way. And because he's God Almighty, he has a right to be angry because his ways are good and mine are not necessary, and, and therefore I'm a sinner, and, and if I have transgressed against the law, then there's a punishment to be paid, and there's somebody who paid the punishment on my behalf, they, they paid the price for me, so therefore now I am no longer guilty, and therefore I'm free, and because Jesus rose again, that means he overcame sin and death, therefore I can overcome sin and death too uh, by putting my faith in him. So now I've comprehended it, but just because you heard it and you comprehended it doesn't mean you trust it. It doesn't mean that you really believe in it and that you trust this to be true. And that's the last element. Do you trust this to be true? And faith requires a fact, a comprehension, and a trust. And of course, you will know whether you trust it depending on how you live your life. That's how you will know that you trust it. Okay, so faith is not the opposite of thinking. It requires fact, comprehension, and trust. Now, the question is, since you need to trust in something, is faith the opposite of doubt? And the answer is no. Everybody has doubts. I know that if I go through a week, I, I have doubts at times. Um, you know, when you're in the plane and you're flying and you, you even put your trust in the plane and suddenly that, that little thing happens where... The plane just drops for a, a little meter or something. Oh, that moment, I have a little moment of doubt right there. Like, I, I get all nervous and I, you know, I, I probably say a little prayer, oh Lord, no. Like, you know, if it's my time, it's my time, you know. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I got to preach the gospel to myself, you know. I, I believe in Jesus, you know. I just say it to myself one more, one, two, one more time. And a little doubt happens, but just because that little moment of doubt happens doesn't mean I'm not going to get into the next plane. I still trust in planes. So I think doubt does not... It's not the opposite of faith. In fact, faith is trusting God in the midst of doubt. That's what faith is. Even though you don't fully comprehend everything perfectly, even though you have moments of doubt, faith is still trusting God in the midst of doubt. In the Gospel of Mark, there was a story of this man who said, I believe, help my unbelief. There, there was still some unbelief, there were still some moments where he had doubt, but he was still somebody who had faith. So faith is trusting in spite of doubt, or in the midst of doubt. So faith is um, not, not thinking, it's not the opposite of doubt. So is, is, is faith a feeling? Um, some of you probably feel spiritually dry. You don't feel connected with God. So is, is, failing, is faith this, this feeling of, of being connected with God? And the answer is no, because feelings can be deceiving. And I, I don't know your background, but probably if you, if you grew up in a church, and I know many of you guys did grow up in kind of some kind of church environment, so if you grew up in a more you know, charismatic, Pentecostal background, then probably for you, faith is when you are really excited about the promises of God. And you're standing in worship, and you're raising your hand, you feel really excited, and that's, that's when you feel connected with God. And that's probably how you say, okay, then, then I know my faith is real. Uh, if you come from a more mainline church or a reform kind of background, then probably when you feel really bad about your sin, right? That's when you feel unconnected to God. You know, when, when, when I preach a sermon and say, you little worms are all going against God and reflect on the last week how you have cheated and how you have lied, and you come back, oh, Pastor, you know, must have a great, great, great sermon today because I made you feel really bad um, um, about your sin. Because we think spiritual vitality, um, it proves to us, because if I feel guilty... That means I'm spiritually alive. Because if I wouldn't feel anything, that's the problem. But since I feel something, I must be spiritually alive. So I don't know whether, whether it's the excitement or, or standing on the promises and excited about the promise of God, or um, if you're convicted about uh, sin, then you feel alive. 
But let me tell you, spiritual vitality is not determined by your feelings. Now, when I say that, I want to be careful. It doesn't mean that faith doesn't affect feelings. Feelings are part of faith. Um, your faith informs your feelings, what you rejoice in, what you feel sorrow in. You know, there, there are aspects. Jesus did weep when he saw Jerusalem. There, there are feelings involved. There are things that we rejoice in and that gives us joy. But, but your feelings don't determine your faith. Your faith determines what you feel and how you feel about certain things. So faith is not a feeling. So, I have one more. Is faith boldness? And sometimes we hear that statement, just step out in faith. You know, just, just, just by faith, just, just, just go do it by faith and uh, step out. You know, go big or go home. You know, take that step like Peter, walk, walk on water. And if you, if you take this risk, then you have faith. You know, muster up some inner strength. Try to do something, even though it might fail. And if you are able to do that, then you are faithful. No, faith is not wishful thinking that leads to risky behavior. It is not. Now, I do think that we put our faith in Jesus. Uh, we will say and behave in a way that others might think is risky. Because their value system is different. So therefore, we behave in certain ways and they will say, oh, that's a really risky behavior. But for us, it's not a risky behavior because in light of eternity and in light of Christ, we know what is risk and what is not risk. So our measure of risk is different but you don't have to muster up some kind of giant leap of faith you know, to say that you are a faithful person or that you have faith. So faith is not the opposite um, of, of you know, mustering up, or, or faith is not mustering up some kind of risky behavior and doing that. Now, one more thing is, when we say faith that saves, we're also not saying that faith in itself is that what saves. Um, faith has no intrinsic efficacy. Uh, faith has no power in itself. Um, if I say I have faith in the chair, just because I exercise faith in the chair, that, that faith in the chair does not save me. Because faith is merely the, the channel by which we appropriate God's grace for us and the finished work of Christ on the cross for us, which the grace we will talk about next week, uh, sola gratia. But it is... Faith in itself, because you can have faith in, in various things, faith in the chair. You can have faith that I will finish this sermon in the next 30 minutes. And by some miracle, I might. Um, but even if that miracle comes true and you have faith in that, just because it comes true, it doesn't save you. Right? So, so faith in itself doesn't save you. It's the object of faith that matters. Um, faith in Jesus' work on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins, that is what saves. Which means, if it's not the faith in itself, that means that the measure of faith doesn't matter, and neither does the quality of faith matter. That means you can have a lot of really good faith in something that doesn't save. The measure and quality does not save you. The quantity doesn't save you. Little mustard seed faith that has doubt written all over it in the finished work of Jesus, that saves. Now, I think that quantity and quality of faith helps you live out your life as a Christian. It helps you find joy. It helps you find purpose. It, it helps you live out the faith in the way you want to. So, so in a way, it's good to grow in faith. But quantity and quality of faith doesn't save. The object of faith saves. <laughs> Romans 1.16 says this, the gospel is the power unto salvation. You need to have faith in that, in the gospel, in the finished work of Christ. The Bible knows of no other means of salvation other than trusting in Christ and resting in his finished work. Saving faith is faith that not only knows and comprehends the facts about the gospel of Jesus Christ, but also trusts in the person and work of Jesus Christ alone for salvation. That's the definition. Let me say it again. Saving faith is faith that not only knows and comprehends the facts about the gospel of Jesus Christ, but also trusts in the person and work of Jesus Christ alone for salvation. So that's the definition of the faith that saves that we're talking about. When we're saying you need to have faith alone, then it's this definition, that faith alone. Which then comes to the second question, why does this faith have to be alone? 
Um, and the primary answer to that would be first because God says so, because Scripture says so. As we read this morning, Galatians 2.15, ourselves are Jews by birth, not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. So scripture clearly says that. But it's also very logical. Um, if you add any form of work or, or performance or action to faith, then you're kind of partnering with God in, in the action of salvation. And since you are also then contributing to it, you should get some credit and therefore you should get some glory. And we know from two weeks ago that our salvation is for God's glory alone. So if you have any part to play, you should get some credit. And if you get some credit, then you get to share in that glory which belongs to God alone. And thirdly, if you add any works of actions to faith um, to then have salvation, it will then really become dependent on the measure of the ability for you to perform that action or that addition that you have added. And that's not good news. That is bad news. It is actually going back to Old Testament law. That you have to perform, and even, even if you have this minute little thing that you add on, suddenly the performance of that minute little thing will determine your faith or your justification, your righteousness. And Galatians 2, 21 says, Do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Paul, in the book of Galatians, when he starts off, he's addressing this very fact. And moralists, Judaizers, uh, religious type Jewish Christian leaders came and said, um, that you need to add back the moral laws of, of circumcision and upholding food regulations, um, the Jewish customs to then become a Christian, to, to truly be a Christian. So by saying that you add any kind of work, you're pretty much going back to moral law. And Paul said in Galatians 1, if anybody would come and preach that kind of gospel, let them be cursed. Because it's no longer good news. It's no longer the gospel. It's another gospel. It's no longer the Christian belief. Because the difference between Christianity and any other religion on the world, in the world, is that we put our faith in Christ's finished work alone and not by any conformity to religious practices. No religious practices. It is just faith alone, in Christ alone. So therefore, nothing can be added to the faith in Christ. It will be counter the Christian gospel. So, let us take some time to then examine together what it is we usually add to the faith. In our everyday lives, what, what is it that we always struggle with and that we add and then rely for for justification for thinking and feeling that we are right before god well the first one is personal upholding of a moral ethic we we, we set a, a a standard we even might take a biblical standard we, we look at the bible and says these are all the commandments this is this is how i should behave and i'm not saying they're bad but i'm saying that that I means the Bible is good, right? But we, we take that and we might add some of our own or we just make up some or we just look at our culture around us and we take their moral values and we add them and we say, I am saved because I uphold all these law. And that's another way of saying, that's a religious way of saying, let me say, tell you the, the non-religious way of saying it. I think I'm a good person. Because I think I'm saved because I don't kill anybody. I don't cheat. I don't lie. You know, I, I don't I don't create any crime. I'm a, I'm a I'm a good person. But you're not saved by being a good person. You're saved by faith alone. And often we say this, oh, I believe my friend, my spouse, my my partner, my whoever is saved because I think they're a good person. God's holiness, God's glory 
cannot stand your imperfection. God is holy and pure. It does even the, the slightest imperfection. We talked about that two weeks ago. God's, you cannot come into God's presence. So a, a, a small little imperfection will not let you come into God's presence. He will consume you. You, you. you will burn up. And all of us are imperfect. None of us is perfectly holy, perfectly pure. None of us fully uphold every single commandment that is laid in here. But that's usually what we add. We add a personal upholding of morality. So we're saying, yes, I put my faith in Jesus, but also I must do all these things. Uh, the second thing might be social work. Um, you know, caring for the needy. Um, your heart for social justice does not save you. Your amount of good works, Samaritan character, love for neighbor, care for the needy, can't even make up for the selfish indulgence of a white lie. The Bible says, your good works are filthy rags. Because, let's be honest, if, if you think your good works are going to save you, you caring for somebody else is going to save you, then your good works is no longer for that person. It's actually for yourself. It's a selfish behavior. I, I do this, and before I, because I do all these things to these people, because I'm so nice, I'm so good, therefore I'll be saved, then the action is actually not for them, it's actually for yourself. So no good, selfless behavior can happen if you actually think it's going to save you. So social work doesn't save you. That's usually what we add on. Um, another one, and I think it's common probably in, in our type of church, um, which is intellectual ascent. Uh, if we think that we really understand the five solas, then we will be saved. Let me tell you, um, the sermons that we preached uh, over these five weeks, if you don't really understand them, but you understand you're saved in Jesus, you are saved. The true comprehension of the five solas and understanding systematic theology does not save you. It doesn't. Um, in the book of James, James says that even demons know that God is one and shudder. What it means. He's saying that even demons have a good theology about the Trinity, and even they have an emotional reaction. They shudder. Yes, they know the truth. They know the fact. They, they comprehend it, but they don't put their trust in it. They don't have faith. So you can recite Wayne Grudem word for word and still not be saved. Nobody has saved themselves from intellectual ascent. We can have lots of lots of meaningless theological debate, and it will not save a single soul. No, theological ascent does not save us. And that's usually what we add on. We think, oh, this person has bad doctrine. Oh, I better go and preach the gospel to him. Um, we add that on as a requirement. Even gospel-centeredness, and I'm preaching to my own heart right here, uh, I, I can take gospel-centeredness and make it a, a, a bar above faith alone. If somebody doesn't really comprehend the implications of all the aspects of the gospel and able to live it out, then they're probably not saved. No, that's not true. That's not true. It's simple faith in the basics of the gospel that saves. So even something that I personally prize very high and probably my moralistic judgment and suddenly comes out, that doesn't save you. Even demons have great theology and shudder and are not saved. And lastly, um, or not lastly, no, one more, um, it is not determined by church participation. A lot of times we think that we are saved by participating in the activities of the church. We look around, oh, I must be okay because you know, I, I come on time. I'm, I'm part of the, the worship team. I, 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 I serve. You know, I, I, have a, I read the Bible regularly, therefore I must be saved. I, I pray. Um, I'm, a, I'm a member of a local church. Amen. Doesn't save you. Um, I got baptized. I, 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 I take the Lord's Supper. All these things, church participation does not save you. A lot of times we look around and we measure our faith by our participation in the local church. No. 
Justification is not measured or determined by church participation. And then it is not measured by trying harder in any of these things. Because a lot of times we go around and say, oh, I think I just need to try harder. If I, if I try harder, then I will be really saved. And you could take any of these things. And then when you actually, for a week, try a little harder, then you feel a bit better about your faith. Because you've tried harder. Trying harder doesn't save you. It's by faith alone. Now, I want to be clear. Um, and Calvin, John Calvin, uh, puts it nicely. It is faith alone that justifies, but the faith that justifies is not alone. That means... If you have faith in Jesus and you believe these things, then it will affect the way you live. And then you will try to understand theology. And then you will participate in a local church. And you will go and care for the needy people. And you will actually try to be participating in, 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 in the church. And you will uphold a moral ethic. Now, it's, it's, it's a natural effect. And um, I, I brought a ball with me today. Um, innovative church illustration. Uh, but uh, in, in, in a way, it's just like this. You know, if, if I have faith, it's kind of throwing up the ball. And everything that I do because the ball is, is the falling down of the ball. So faith is, I, I have faith, I throw up the ball. And the falling down is, yes, I will then participate in church. I will then uh, uh, try to understand theology better. I will help to... It's, it's a natural outflow. It's a natural reaction. So there is something which is done, which is the faith, and everything else is a natural reaction. Now... Can I, can I measure that your faith by just looking at the falling of the ball? No, because somebody can go up to a balcony and just drop the ball, right? So just because you see a ball dropping doesn't mean that somebody has actually thrown up the ball. The throwing up the ball is the faith. Um, let me um, give a, another illustration. I, I went hiking with Jordan the other day, and uh, we exercised. After about you know, 15 minutes, I was covered with sweat. Um, Jordan wasn't. But um, after about one hour of walking, even Jordan had a little sweat, <laughs> right? And I'm, I'm saying even Jordan, why? Because Jordan is just completely dehydrated right now. There he is, okay. Uh, because he just did a bodybuilding competition and he couldn't drink water, so he's, he's, he's dry, he's, you know, he, he's toned. And, and, but even he sweat a little bit, which means exercise produces sweat. Faith produces all these things. But now, you can have sweat without exercise, can't you? I mean, I'm a big man in Malaysia. I sweat all the time. So if you see me sweating, it doesn't mean that I necessarily have exercised. Right? You can go into the sauna and sweat. So yes, if you, if you exercise, you will sweat. You have all these evidences. But just because you have the evidences doesn't mean you have actually exercised. So, so what are the evidences that come are the ones I mentioned, but uh, according to a uh, Baptist sending mission organization, uh, which is often referred to as uh, the company, um, um, they uh, said uh, these things um, uh, that will happen. Um, you will have, if you put faith, you have a new heart. Uh, disciples are spiritually regenerate. God has forgiven their sins, and God's spirit now dwells in them. If you put your faith in Jesus, you have a new mind. Uh, disciples are biblically grounded. They believe what Jesus says. Um, if you put your faith in Jesus, you have new affections. Disciples are deeply satisfied. Their desires are what Jesus desires. You have a new will. Desire, disciples are humbly obedient. Uh, they do what Jesus commands. You have new relationships. Uh, disciples love sacrificially. They serve as Jesus serves. You have a new purpose. Disciples are missionally engaged. They make disciples who make disciples of all nations. But all these things don't save you. It's faith that saves you, and then the faith will have you have, have all these things. So because you have a new heart, a new mind, new affection, it will affect how you live. You will grow in holiness and uphold moral code. You will grow in understanding the faith and theology. You will participate in the church, but none of these save you. You are saved for good works, not by good works. So faith needs to be alone. Because faith plus anything equals nothing. And faith plus nothing equals everything. So, the last question. What happens when faith is not alone? What happens if you add any of these things and think that by adding these things, I am justified, I am saved? Well, 
two things can happen. One of them is bad, and the other is very bad. Let me go with the bad one first. You put all these additional add-ons to the faith, let's say, for example, like upholding a moral code or having a good theology. And what happens is that you set a standard and you try to uphold it and you fail. You will be in despair. You will be just like Martin Luther, trying to find some kind of stairs that you can kneel on and climb up and pay for the penalty of your sin. You'll be in despair. You'll feel terrible because you think that you are cursed. You think that you are damned. You will think that you are not saved because you have not performed to the standard which you have set. Now, there's a B version, a second version um, of that, which is you feel despair. You're not performing because, not of your fault, because of the fault of another. Let's say you try to come on church on time and your spouse delays you again. So now you are not performing to the standard, not because of your own fault, but because of your spouse. Now the Bible says to wives, submit to your husbands, but maybe your husband is a moron. And it's really, really hard to submit to him. So then, because your husband's fault, you cannot obey the God's command to submit to your husband. And then you get angry. The Bible says, love your wife sacrificially. Maybe she's putting demands upon you which are just so hard to meet and you cannot sacrificially love her in that way. So either you're in despair because you think it's your fault or you're angry because you think it's somebody else's fault. And that's a bad, bad place to be in. And that's because you put on something additional to faith for the justification of your sin for you to be the right standing before God. It says here in our text today, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to do them. And that's why you will feel cursed. You'll feel damned. So that's the bad thing. Let me tell you the worst thing. You succeed. You put on a standard. And you're able to perform it. You succeed. You, you give to the poor. Your money comes into your bank from your salary. Five minutes later, it's 10%. Swoop into the church account. On time, perfectly. You give 20%, actually, because you're better than everybody else. You, you come on time. You, you read your Bible. You underline every second word in Wayne Grudem's systematic theology, and you understand it. You know, you have great debates about, I don't know, what's, what's the latest one? The eternal generation of the sun. You look in the mirror and you say, good and faithful servant. Whatever standards that you have put, you, 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 you succeed on those standards. And, and let's be fair, I think nobody really looks in the mirror and does that. And, and you know, this pride that comes out of that, I don't think we, we, we really realize it, that we actually look in the mirror and say it, but let me, let me show you how, how it probably shows up. Um, you, you will look at people who sin differently than you, and you start judging them. Oh, see how that person has sinned. Oh, don't think that person understands justification by faith alone. Don't think that person is really gospel-centered. Um, you make snarky comments about people's bad theology. And, and all these reflections I'm doing, not because I've observed others, but because I reflect on my own heart, just to, to, to let you guys know that. It's not because I look at, oh, look what they're doing. I'm, these are all observations I'm doing because I do them. And you become arrogant and boastful. You think that you're better than others. You make fun of others. Um, there's also this other version, which is the pretentious pity version. Oh, look at her. Poor soul. She, she couldn't do better. You know, her background. Her background. There's this snarky, pretentious pity that you think that this person is a terrible person, but they can't help themselves. 
um, or you become very exclusive. You, you draw boundaries. Oh, oh, only these people are Christians. Everybody else is not. You Bible bash people. You have a verse for everything. Um, truth is more important to you than love. You know, you say, if that person would just know this, then they will get it. And you're probably very concerned on how people perceive you. That you have to uphold that moral law all the time, that code. It's a pride that arises in us because we think we are upholding God's law. We are better than all these sinners who do not uphold God's moral law. But we do. Let me tell you one thing. Um, Jesus, when he came on earth, he spent time and sat down and drank and ate with sinners. But when he talked to the religiously pride people, Pharisees, he called them vipers. It's worse. And why is it worse? Because pride doesn't repent. Pride doesn't recognize its own mistake, doesn't fall on his knees and says sorry and repents of its sin. Pride doesn't repent. So, so what do we do then? How, how do we solve this problem? Because if I look at my everyday, I'm either in despair often, I look at my personal life and I'm in despair, or I think I'm actually doing it and I feel good about myself, and I look at other people like, oh, I'm better than them. My heart always tends to compare. So, so, so what, what do we do then? And the only solution is this, to look at the cross. The only way is to look at the cross. Because when you look at the cross of Christ, you will see one thing, that you are so sinful, so bad, so broken, that you could not save yourself. God had to send his son to die for you. And if you see that, then there's, there's, there's no reason for you to be prideful. Because you are made righteous on the account of another. Somebody else's righteousness was put on you. You have nothing to do with your salvation except for the sin that's required for Jesus to justify it through the finished work on the cross. There's no reason for you to be prideful. It melts away the pride. But at the same time, when you look at the cross, it melts away to despair. Because God so loved you that he did choose to send his son to die for you. Jesus did die for you. It says here, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith. In our text, it says that Jesus became a curse for us. So when we feel cursed, we feel damned, Jesus took on the damnation. He took on that curse. He took all the penalty for us. And by putting our faith in that alone, in that alone, we are saved. It melts away all pride. It takes away all despair and all anger because nobody can mess it up for you. Jesus completely secured it for you. However somebody else behaves, however somebody else stops you from living out your faith in that moment, it's okay. Because Jesus paid it in full. Brothers and sisters, this is what it means to put our faith in Christ alone. That is what justifying faith is. In faith alone, when we say that, in faith alone, it is that faith that Jesus Christ on the cross paid for all the penalty of our sins. And because he rose again, we are justified and we can stand in the presence of God for eternity. In that we place our faith, in faith alone in that nothing else saves. And that faith is a gift. It is a gift of God. By grace, which we will talk about next week. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. And Father, we, we pray right now that you would, through the power of your Spirit, give us faith. Faith in your Son's finished work on the cross. Father, help us 
preach the gospel to our hearts day in and day out. For our hearts are full of deceit. Father, we either end up in despair by looking at ourselves or anger by looking at others or pride because we think we have anything to do with our salvation. But Father, help us to just look at Christ crucified and help us live out this faith day by day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.